Well, as I said, we're in a series here where we're going through the gospel of uh, John together. And we are in chapter eight. I, last week I shared with you kind of the major thought of each of the chapters we've been in so far. Chapter one, Jesus is God. Chapter two, Jesus turns water into wine. Chapter three, Jesus talks with Nicodemus. Chapter four, Jesus talks with a woman at a well. Chapter five, Jesus heals a man at a pool. Chapter six, Jesus feeds 5,000 plus people. Chapter seven, Jesus promises living water. And then chapter eight, Jesus talks with an adulterous woman. We looked at that story uh, last, last weekend. And I got a, a lot of emails uh, asking if I would print those, those out for you. And so in your program, in the notes section, I've actually put uh, those eight title headings, if you will, for you. And I realized that a whole lot more happened in those chapters than what I just rattled off, okay? I understand that. But I wanna challenge you maybe just to memorize those major headings. Because if you would have those memorized, you'll have an overview of John's gospel. When you think about John's gospel and you'll be able to go, oh yeah, John chapter one, that's where, that's where Jesus is, is God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God in verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Oh yeah, chapter two, that's where Jesus did his first miracle at Cana, he turned water into wine. Yeah, you know, chapter three, that's where he had that crazy conversation with that religious leader named Nicodemus. Yeah, chapter four, that's where he meets that woman at a well and literally transforms her life and she goes back to her own city and, you know, her revival breaks out. And so let me challenge you just to continue to maybe memorize some of these major thoughts that I've kind of laid out for you. Now, the original plan was, is I was going to move on to chapter 9 today, uh, but I, I, as I was reading chapter 8, there were just a couple of things that I just went, wow, I, I can't move on, and it doesn't matter how long we go through this series, it, 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 you know, you've got to be in the Word of God here every weekend, and though it's going to kind of goof some other things up, and so we're going we're gonna to stay right here in chapter 8. And so again, remember chapter eight begins with Jesus having this really beautiful moment with a very sinful woman, a woman who was caught red-handed in the very act of adultery. And we see Jesus standing between her and some really evil men who literally wanted her dead. And we looked at that last, last week and the rest of chapter eight is, is basically Jesus having a conversation with different groups of people. And here's what I wanna, I wanna do here this morning. I, I'm gonna ask and answer a, a few questions uh, th- this morning, okay? Two of them are, are major questions. They're, they're really weighty, weighty questions. And the first one is this. When you take your last breath here on planet Earth, How can you be sure you'll be with Jesus in heaven for eternity? That's a a pretty good question. That's a pretty weighty question. It's one that probably most of us in this room or over in the venue or those watching online could answer. Some of you may, may not be able to answer it, but it's certainly a weighty, weighty question. Look at verse 21 of John chapter eight, okay? Later Jesus said to them again, and he's talking to a group of unbelievers, okay? I'm going away, Jesus said. You will search for me, but you will die in your sin. You cannot come to where I'm going. The people ask, is is he planning to commit suicide? What what does he mean? You cannot come where I'm going. And Jesus continued, you are from below. I am from above. You belong to this world. I do not. That is why I said that you will die 
in your sins. For unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Who are you, they demanded. And Jesus replied, the one I have always claimed to be. Wow. That was intense, wasn't it? I mean, that's a, an intense few verses. And it's really, really clear what he's saying. Look again at verse 21. Later, Jesus said to them, and again, he's talking to unbelievers here, I am going away. And, and this is a reference to him dying on the cross and then ascending to the right hand of the Father. That's what he's talking about there. I'm gonna go away. He's gonna die. I'm gonna put him in a tomb. He's gonna walk out of the tomb and he's gonna ascend to the right hand of the Father. That's what he's talking about here. You will search for me but you will die in your sins. You cannot come to where I'm going. So apparently, if you die in your sin, you can't go to where Jesus was going or to where Jesus is, is now. So the problem is the sin thing. If you die in your sin, you get rejected when you try to get into heaven. It's not gonna happen. In other words, some people won't go to heaven to be with Jesus because of this thing called sin. That's what we know so far. Now, Jesus said something just like it to a group of unbelieving religious leaders in John chapter seven. Jesus said, I am with you only for a short time, and then I go to be, the one, to be with the one who sent me. Once again, this is a reference to Jesus dying on a cross and then ascending to the right hand of the Father in heaven. He says, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Once again, some people aren't going to be able to get into heaven where Jesus is. And it's all because of sin. In other words, there are some people who Jesus will reject from getting into heaven. He loves everybody, there's no doubt about that. But there are some people who won't be able to go to where he was going or where he is now. Romans chapter three, unfortunately, says this. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So if we've all sinned, then no one is able to go to heaven. No one is going to be able to go where Jesus was going or is now because it's sin that keeps us out of heaven. Now, in John chapter 13, Jesus says the same thing as he says in our text today, but he adds something a little bit different. Jesus says in verse 33, dear children, I will be with you only a, a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are one of my disciples. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't come with me now, but you will follow me later. So here we have Jesus telling his disciples that they would be able to go to heaven to be where Jesus was going or, or is now. So, so obviously there must be a solution to the problem of sin. I mean, these guys are, are, are going there. So what's the solution? What's the solution to our problem 
of sin. How do, how do you get rid of the sin in your life so that you can go to be where Jesus was going or where he is, is now? That's, that's a pretty good question. Well, right after Jesus says this in John chapter 13, he goes on to say this in chapter 14. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. He's talking to Peter and the disciples. Trust in God and trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. There's more than enough room in, in heaven. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Man, I'm thankful he asked that question. I really am. And Jesus told him, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life, and no one can come to the Father. No one can come to where I'm going, where he is now. Nobody gets to heaven, Jesus says, except through me. Except through me. According to Jesus, there's only one way you can be where he is going or where he is now. There's only one way when you take your last breath, you're gonna be with Jesus forever in eternity in heaven. And that's through a relationship with him. Because when you surrender your life over to him, Jesus takes care of the problem of sin that we all and we all have to wrestle around with. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2. He said, he, that's Jesus, personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. You see, Jesus took all of your sins upon himself when he went to the cross. And he took all of that sin with him into the tomb. And when he walked out, he left all of your sin in the tomb. That if you would put your trust in him, he would heal you spiritually. By his wounds, the wounds that were in his hands from the nails, the, the wounds that were in his legs from the nail, the wound that was in his side from the spear, the wounds from all of the lashings he took from the Roman soldiers, by his wounds, the blood that flowed from those wounds, you would be healed spiritually. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter five for, for a moment here, okay? We're doing a little, little Bible study here because there's a really weighty thing here in Romans chapter five that I want us to walk through. I want you to understand this, okay? In Romans chapter five, in verse 12, it says this, and I'm gonna walk through this, and for some of you, it's gonna go right over your head, and, and that's okay, that's okay. But, but I wanna walk through this. Paul says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. And Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone because everybody has sinned. So Paul, in the New Testament here, is taking us all the way back to Genesis chapter three. And he says, when Adam sinned, when Adam blew God off in Genesis chapter three, when Adam disobeyed God and sinned, at that moment, everything changed. Sin was now going to be um, a part of the equation of life. 
One of the things that we all have in common in this room and over in the venue or you're watching online or listening on the radio is that all of us have sinned, all of us, and it's all because of what happened in Genesis chapter three. And sin brought death. The reason we die, the reason every one of you will die is simply because of sin. It was never God's intention that we would die. It's Adam's fault when he sinned. And because we've all sinned, Paul says, it's death has spread to everybody. Look at verse 14. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who is yet to come. So remember, you got one guy, blew it for everybody, right? And Paul says, he, he's gonna be like another guy who's gonna come. Verse 15, but there's a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we're guilty of many sins. Verse 17, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a really, really beautiful and weighty little uh, uh, section of scripture. Just really beautiful. Paul says, hey, look, one man goofed the whole thing up. One man brought death. And he's sort of like the other guy, the one man. And we're celebrating the day that one man was born. Jesus. One man goofed everything up, wow. But one man makes it all better. But then he says, but that one guy, he was one dimensional. All he did was bring death. But this other man, Jesus Christ, wow. Adam, Adam's sin brought death, but God's gift of Jesus Christ brought life. Adam's sin, all it did was bring death, but God's gift brought grace. Adam's sin, all it did was bring death to all of us, but God's gift of Jesus Christ brought justification and righteousness and reconciliation. Adam's sin brought death, but God's gift brought cleansing, the cleansing of our sin. As I was looking at this passage this past week, I couldn't help but think about how much God hates sin. Think about it. One little sin in the Garden of Eden condemned the entire human race. One little sin. One little sin separated us from God. One little sin doomed us all for hell. This helps you understand how much God hates sin. Because all it took was Adam blowing God off one time. And look at the carnage that it brought. No wonder God hates sin so much. But these verses here in Romans chapter five also teach us that as much as God hates sin, he loves the sinner more. And it's proven in his response to that sin. His response could have been, you know what, I'm done with you. I created you in my image, I gave you life, I gave you breath, I keep your heart beating, I've done everything for you, look at you. You don't even believe in me, some of you. I'm done with you. But he doesn't do that. The Bible says he demonstrates how much he loves us and that while we were yet sinners, 
He sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us, to take care of the problem of, of sin. Now I want you to look again at what Jesus said in verse 24 of our, our text, okay? Jesus said, that is why I said you will die in your sins for unless... You believe that I am who I claim to be. Unless you surrender your life over to me, Jesus says. Unless you humble yourself before me and let me control your life, let me and my will be the most important thing in your life, you will die in your sins. So back to the question. When you take your last breath here on earth, how can you be sure you'll be with Jesus in heaven? Well, the answer is you surrender your life over to Jesus. That's how you know. My question is, is have you done that? Have you surrendered your life over to Christ? If you were to take your last breath, would you right now just die in your sin and thus not be able to go to where Jesus is right now. Jesus said this in John chapter three. He said, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, you cannot go to be where he is right now in heaven. You cannot. And what does it mean to be born again? Everybody in this room was born once, right? We all came out of somebody's womb. We were born physically. But because of Adam, when we were born physically, we were born in sin. And so Jesus says, you have to be born again. And he's talking about a spiritual birth. You were born once physically. And now he says, you must be born again. You must give your life over to me. You must surrender your life to me and be born spiritually. And when that happens, he comes into your life and he cleanses you of your sin. Yeah. And if you're here, let me just tell you, when we're done, uh, we're gonna change the altar room around and I'm, I'm gonna be in there when we're done here in a little bit. And if you're here and you would like to surrender your life to Christ. All you gotta do is just come in that room and I'm gonna be there. Last night, there were a couple of people who came in, had the greatest time in there last night as people gave their life to Christ in that room. And our pastors and elders will be out here if you'd like prayer. But if you're here and you, you wanna surrender your life to Christ, all you gotta do is go into the altar room. And I'd love to meet with you and pray with you. Now here's the second major question. Okay, and they, 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 they kind of go hand in hand to a, to a certain degree. And this was the passage that made me stop and go, man, I gotta, I'm gonna handle a couple of things in Romans 8 before we go on to Romans 9. Here's the question. Is there room in your heart for Jesus and his word? Look at verse 31. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. Okay? And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that's a, a phrase that is abused and misquoted by a lot of people. In fact, you can Google it when you get home, that phrase, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, is actually in the motto of the CIA. That's their motto. Some of you are going, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. You can Google it later. He's talking about the truth of the word. It's the truth of God's word. That'll set you free. The truth that you were created in the very image of God. The truth that, that Adam's sin just spread to, to you and everybody else. The, the truth that you, you, you can't save yourself. There's nothing you can do to rid yourself of the problem of sin. 
It doesn't matter how much money you put in that little green bag a little bit ago. That, that doesn't solve the problem of sin. It doesn't matter whether you're baptized. That doesn't solve the problem of sin. It doesn't matter whether you stood up and raised your hand and sang songs. That doesn't you know, solve the problem of sin. You could be an Eagle Scout. That's a wonderful thing, but it doesn't solve the problem of sin. Hey, I'm an American, man. I was born in America, big deal. That doesn't solve the problem of sin. The truth is sin doomed us all, and you got to understand that. It's the truth that God so loved us that he promised to send us a Messiah, a Savior. The truth that today in the town of David, a Savior has been born for you. The truth that God loved you and he fulfilled his promise by sending Jesus. The truth that Jesus lived a perfect life, a sinless life. The truth that he voluntarily went to a cross. The truth that he was put into a tomb. The truth that three days later he walked out of that tomb proving that he was who he said he was and that was God's son. The truth that he's up at the right hand of the Father right now. The truth that if you would invite him into your life, he'd cleanse you of your sin. When you understand the truth and you embrace the truth, it'll set you free. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Hey, it's truth that two plus two is four. That truth won't set you free. It's just truth. That's all it is. Verse 33. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anybody. What do you mean we will be set free? And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. And now look at verse 37. This was the passage that stopped me in my track this week. Yes, I realize that you are descendants of Abraham, Jesus said, and yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no room in your hearts for my message. Some of your Bibles say there's no room in your heart for my word. Wow. Man. I was in my office this week and I just just stopped. It was like the Holy Spirit just, you know, Slammed on the brakes. Like, no, no, no. I don't want you to go to chapter nine. And I kept looking at that phrase. I want you, in fact, I want you to zero in on, on verse 37. There's no room in your hearts for my message. I just think that's really interesting. Jesus says, look, <laughs> Your life is so filled up with stuff. You you got no space for me or my word. And this tells me that it's possible to have our lives so full of things that you got no room for Jesus and his word in your life. That passage tells me that it's possible to get our lives so packed with things, even good things, that there's literally no room for Jesus and his word in our lives. And that's not a good thing. There's a very familiar story found in the Bible about two gals that loved Jesus deeply. It says this in Luke chapter 10. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Okay? She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that she had to make. I mean, she's in the kitchen baking a pie. She's got the iced tea going. She's got, you know, buns in the oven. She's vacuuming, making sure everything's neat, doing all these really great things. She came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to do all the work by myself? Come on, Lord. Tell her to get her lazy, you know, rear end up. I'm doing all the work. 
And I have no doubt that Martha thought for a fact that Jesus was gonna go, wow, you're right. Hey, Mary, get up. Get in there and help your poor sister out. Quit sitting at my feet listening to me. It's much more important that the tea get made. It's much more important that the pie gets baked. It's much more important that the you know, carpet gets vacuumed. And sit and listen to me. She actually thought that. That's how distracted she was. She actually thought that Jesus would look at somebody who was just sitting there listening to him. Hey, get up and go to work. Martha, Martha, the Lord said, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. What I think is interesting is he doesn't tell Martha, Martha, sit down. He left that up to her, didn't he? I don't know what she did. I would hope she had enough sense to go, uh, I wish Jesus would have said, hey, look, Martha, look, your tea ain't that good. God, <laughs> I've had it before, and your pie, eh, it's okay. You know, I don't know. I had better on my travels, so just let it go, man. I, I, I just, you know, not, he just says, Martha, your sister chose the better thing. I'm not going to take it away from her. Let me give you an illustration. So in our home, um, we, we don't, we, our closet in our bedroom really isn't that big. Uh, it's probably, you know, I don't know, it's probably bigger than most, but, but it's not that big, really. And so, um, you know, it's been the summer season, and so my wife has clothes in there that are appropriate for the summer. They're lighter, they may be short-sleeved or whatever. There's no coats or sweaters and things like that because there isn't any room for all her coats because they're, they're big and sweaters and maybe thicker pants or whatever. And so what happens is, is she has to go in and she takes all of the summer stuff out because, wow, the weather changed, didn't it? And she'll take out all of the thinner, I don't know, dresses or thinner tops or thinner pants or whatever they all are, and, and, and she'll take those and she'll put them in our spare bedroom, and then, and, and then she's made room for thicker sweaters and, and jackets that just take up more, more, more space. She had to make room for for other clothes, it didn't all fit. Uh, this Christmas, those of you that have children, you'll, you'll understand this, after you know, December 26, you'll have to go into your son or your daughter's closet and you'll have to make room for all the new toys because it won't all fit. And so you'll have to go through and pull out old toys and give them away, toss them, whatever, so that the new toys can fit. And it, it just kind of happens. The, the old toys aren't evil and wicked. The, the old, you know, or the, the, you know, the summer clothes aren't old, you know, wicked and evil or sinful. It's just, things change. Got to make room. And I think one of the things we have to do every now and again is just stop and look at our own lives and go, man, over this past year, and by the way, you know, this time of year is a good time, you know, New Year's coming up. Hey, Lord, over this past year, has my life got all crowded up, full of stuff? Not evil. Where I really don't have much time for you and your word in my life anymore? That's a good question to wrestle around with. Because I'll tell you right now, the enemy's really good at, you know, giving us this to do and, the, and then, then giving us this to do and then, and then giving us this to do and, and then giving us this to do and, and now it's November and man, a whole year's gone by and now you're all loaded up and you didn't realize it. 
So to take a step back and say, man, I, maybe I need to take some stuff out. I, 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 my schedule's got too full or whatever. I need to make some room. Your personal habits, you know, or whatever. Maybe you got a hobbies and, and you're going, man, this is impacting my life. The Pharisees were so filled up with laws and rules and regulations, they didn't have any room for Jesus. I, I shared this with you a long time ago, but when I first came to the faith in Christ, I, I played a lot of softball. I loved softball. It was one of the things that was really appealing to me about Big Valley Grace was there were a lot of softball leagues and we still have great sports teams here and I loved playing softball and I played on a lot of softball teams, you know, out at Rainbow Fields and traveled around and I played a lot of softball. I love softball. Nothing evil with softball, nothing wicked playing softball. But I uh, was married to my first wife who died in a car accident years ago and I was leaving our house, heading out to Rainbow Fields. I had on my little uni, had my little bag with my bat, had all my glove in it. And I'm driving down Claws Road, heading out to Rainbow Field. And my wife had said something to me when I walked out the door. And uh, wow, I couldn't get it out of my mind. I'm driving down the road. Got, and there's before cell phones, you know. And so I get to the park, walked up to the coach and said, hey, listen, I'm, I just want you to know I'm done. He goes, you mean after the season? I said, no, I'm done tonight. I knew we had plenty of players. I'm done tonight. He goes, well, are you coming back next week? No, I'm done. Well, what about our traveling team? I'm done. And there were a couple other teams that I played, played for. And when I got home, uh, I walked in and my wife's going, what are you doing? I said, you know what? You're right. This has taken a lot of my time. Time I could have spent with you. And I'm not doing this anymore. I called up some of the coaches that I played with on other teams, and I was done. And literally, I don't know, that was, I don't know, 35, 40 years ago, maybe. Eh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe 35 years ago. I never played softball since. Not, not because softball's evil. Not because it's wicked. And I'm not telling you you gotta do it. I just knew it had filled my life up. And I just didn't have a lot of room for Jesus and his word. And I don't know, maybe you need to kind of think through your schedule. We wanna make sure that we leave room for the Lord to work in our lives. You can't lose your salvation, but man, you can certainly get off track and all those kinds of things. And I've, I've given you these things before, but these are things that I, I think will help you leave room for the Lord. And I'm just gonna quickly run through them. This is the practical moment of the sermon, if you will. Number one, always give the Lord the first thoughts of each day. The Bible says, in the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and, and wait in expectation. Now, I'm not saying that you gotta get up in the morning and the first thing you gotta do is sit down and read your Bible and have a quiet time and pray and all that. I recommend that. But what I'm saying is, literally, your alarm goes off. And if you're like me, man, I got an alarm that, like, research went into the sound because it's just like, nyeh, nyeh, nyeh. When my alarm goes off, I'm gonna tell you right now, hell would be having to listen to my alarm for all of eternity. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't be able to take my life. It just would go on and on and on and on. When that goes off, first thing, I said, good morning, Lord. I just immediately engaged this and I acknowledge him. Sometimes I might say, good morning, Lord. Whew, I got, a, I got a rough one today. Here I go, Lord. And then I'm, I'm, almost like a, I'm almost like a zombie. I'm like the walking dead, walking towards this little machine that has this black stuff in it. Because <laughs> I, got, I got nothing, I got nothing. And then and I grab my thing and I put it coffee and I drink my coffee. But I've already said, good morning, Lord. I've already acknowledged him. 
I'm giving him literally the first thought of the, the morning. Look, <laughs> I think there's a reason why there's so many Christians that are all goofed up and stressed out and all of that. They wake up and the first thing they do, instead of getting into the good news, all they do is hear the bad news. They spend their first half an hour listening to, I don't know, bad morning America. <laughs> you know, and it's just, and you, you hear about all the rapes and the murders and all the crummy things that happen in the elections, and you get in your car and you listen to all the talk radio and the yelling and the bickering and all the stuff. And man, and it, it's, just, it's just tough. Instead of saying, Lord, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to acknowledge you in the, the morning. N number two, give, give the first, give the Lord the first day of every week. The Bible says in Acts chapter 20, on the first day of the week, we came together to, bre to break bread. Familiar passage in Hebrew says, let us give up, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. In other words, make a commitment to be in church here every weekend. Isn't it interesting how Stuff fills up in your lives. That man, this hour and a half, which the world says isn't that important, let me just tell you, folks, when the family comes together and together we sing songs to the Lord and together we give our gifts and together we hear the word and together we fellowship. Let me tell you, this hour and a half is weighty, more weighty than I think we really realize. And you should, you should set aside the time and say, man, I'm not gonna let my schedule get so filled up that I can't even go and be with my brothers and sisters. Watching online is better than a sharp poke in the eye, but it ain't the same as being in the building. There's something about the church when it gathers together within, within the brick and mortar that happens that, 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 that's special. Uh, n n number, uh, number three, so, so you give the Lord the first thought every morning, give the Lord the first day of every week, and then give the Lord the first part of every paycheck. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter three, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of, of all your, your crops. When s tracking spiritual growth is really difficult. It's like nailing jello to a tree. I mean, how do you know? I'm growing in my faith. I, I don't know, how do, you, how do you know? There's very few things in scripture that you can point at and go, see right there, there's something that's not subjective, it's objective. And one of those things is your giving. Jesus said, where your shekels are, where you put your money, that's where this is. I didn't say it, he did. And so one of the things you can do to say, man, Lord, do I, have I left room for you? It's just, you're giving. And I know people, you know, before you know it, they bought this, they bought that, they got this, they do this, and man, I, I just don't have anything to give anymore. Well, Jesus would say, if you're not giving, then your heart's really not there. Your heart ain't with me. And you can argue with me all day long, and that's okay, because you're not arguing with me, you're arguing with the, what the Lord said. He's the one who said, where your, your shekels go, that's where your heart goes. And one of the things I know about most of you here at Big Valley Grace is that you're generous people. You get it, and you give. But maybe for some of you, it's a place to, to start. And the last thing is this, is give the Lord the first consideration in every decision. The Bible says, trust the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, give him the first moment of every morning. Give him the first day of every week. Give him the first part of every paycheck. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and then he'll make your paths or your ways straight. Every, everything you do, say, God, I'm, gonna, I'm giving you a shot at this. 
I'm thinking about doing this. I'm thinking about going on vacation here. I'm thinking about retiring. I'm thinking about changing jobs. I'm thinking about whatever it might be. I'm thinking about marrying this girl. I'm thinking about marrying this guy. I'm thinking about starting a business. I'm thinking about going on vacation. Every decision, every decision. Say, God, I'm going to give you a shot at this. You want to weigh in? I think what happens is, is we, as humans, go, well, I give God the big ones. Like, like God goes, whoa, you're right, that is the big one. Whew. That one's a tough one. Let me, let, me, let me sleep on that one. Nothing is big to God, literally, nothing. And so don't categorize the decisions that you let the Lord weigh in on in your life. Because none of them are big to him. I guarantee you, look, look, in fact, this is what I want everybody to do. Over in the venue, everybody here, I want you to stand up. And we're going to say these four things out loud together. And I, th I think, I think you, you, you apply these four things to your life. I think it'll tell you about the room that you have in your heart for him. So let, let, let's say these four things out loud together, okay? Number one, give the Lord the first thoughts of each day. Number two, give the Lord the first day of each week. Number three, give the Lord the first part of every paycheck. And number four, give the Lord the first consideration in every decision. That's pretty practical, isn't it? Let that maybe be a guide. Look at those things and see if they're true in in your life. Father, thank you, Lord, for our time together here. And I am grateful for all of our veterans. And we got a lot of them here in our church. Man, there was a ton of them here last night, this morning. I'm sure there's going to be a bunch next hour. And your word says we're to give honor to whom honor is due. And we just wanted to honor them, Lord. We weren't trying to rob you of any of the glory, Father. Father, I pray for those that might be here and they want to know you. I, I look forward to meeting them in the altar room. May we have a, a great time just together here this great weekend, Veterans Day. And I pray this in your name and all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Blessings.